Good to be here with you again uh, to open our Bibles together to encourage each other in the study of God's Word. And as Jeremy had said, we're going to be in the New Testament, in particular in the Gospels this morning, and looking at Mary of Bethany. We do read about Mary on a few occasions in the Scriptures. She is the sister of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead, uh, also sister of Martha. And in three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and John, we have this wonderful uh, incident of Jesus' feet being anointed by Mary. And uh, he uh, indicates that it has something to do with his death, and we will talk about that as we go forward in our class time this morning. Um, but as we look at at Mary and at what she does, I think there are some valuable lessons for us and, and our service to God, and, and uh, we will benefit from that. And so we're going to begin by reading the text. Uh, Jeremy was wondering which text I was going to go to. We're actually going to go to all of them. And uh, so I will reference where I'm, I'm reading from, but I've, I've put together uh, portions of, of each of them so that we can get the fullest picture of what is taking place. And so I'll just read on through. We're going to be in a bit of John and a bit of Matthew uh, and a bit of Mark uh, just to give a full picture of what has taken place here in the text. And so we're going to start with John chapter 12 and then go over to Mark 14 uh, and then back to John and then to Matthew and then back to Mark again. Um, and so John 12, starting at verse 1, it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Mark 14, verse 3, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, then back to John again, they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table. Excuse me, that's still Mark. Sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and poured it on his head. Now back to John. Uh, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. From Matthew 26, but when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? And they criticized her sharply, but Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now, Matthew has that same, we closed out with Mark 14, verse uh, 5 through 9. Matthew has that same uh, closing where wherever this gospel is preached, what she has done will also be proclaimed as, as a memorial for her or to her. Uh, neither Matthew nor Mark actually identify who the woman is. We need John's account to know who this woman is, that it is in fact Mary of Bethany, sister of Lazarus and of Martha. Now, as we consider the gathering that is taking place, and of course they're in Simon's household, I, I believe Jesus was likely staying in the house of Mary and Martha and uh, Lazarus and, and was going into Jerusalem each day in that final week. 
but this particular feast is in the house of Simon. And there are a number of people who are gathered here who just have very many reasons to be thankful to Jesus for, for him and for his goodness. For instance, the host of the meal, Simon, he's identified as Simon a leper. Well, he's not a leper anymore, otherwise they would not be assembled together with, with him at his house. And so we know nothing else about him. This is all that's ever stated about him in Scripture. There are other Simons, but this Simon, all we know concerning him is that he was a leper and he is no longer. Well, since there was no cure for leprosy, I suggest to you Jesus has healed him of leprosy at some point or another. And therefore, Simon is, is delighted and, and full of gratitude and wants Jesus there with him. Lazarus is sitting at the table, we're told. At the beginning of John chapter 11, Lazarus, recall, was sick. Jesus told the disciples that they were going to go down and, and visit with Lazarus. And in the course of the conversation, he eventually needs to let them know Lazarus is dead. It's not just that he's sick. He actually has died. But we go that he might be raised. And so Jesus and the disciples went to Bethany, and after he had been in the tomb for four days, Jesus called him forth, and Lazarus rose from the dead. Lazarus most certainly has reason to be thankful to Jesus. And then we've got Martha and Mary who are also there, and they were distraught, of course, at the loss of their brother as anyone would be at the loss of a, a loved one. It's, it's never easy to lose one that we are close to. But all indications as you read about these three siblings in Scripture is that they share the same house. There is no indication of any of them being married, so either they are not married or they are widowed, and they are now back together in this same abode in, uh, in Bethany. And so they, would, they saw each other daily, and they interacted daily, and they, you know, this would have built the relationship that already was a close relationship among siblings. They were dependent upon one another. And then all of a sudden, Lazarus was gone. And so Martha and Mary, of course, were filled with grief over this. And when Jesus did arrive after Lazarus had died, we find that Martha actually expresses her belief that Jesus could do something about it. That Jesus has the ability to raise from the dead. And, and we see other occasions where Jesus did raise from the dead. I don't know that she went so far as to ask him to do so, but she knows that he has the ability to do so. And then, of course, he does raise Lazarus from the dead. And, and so everyone who is present at this meal in the house of Simon they have great reason to be thankful to the guest of honor, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the supper was perhaps one of their ways of expressing their thanksgiving to him, their appreciation for him, and to build their relationship with him and with one another even further. Well, he may not have healed you and I of leprosy, and he may not have risen us physically from the dead, but we certainly have reasons to be thankful to Jesus Christ. First of all, he is our creator and our sustainer. We are here because of him. We exist because of him. We live and move and have our being in him, as one of the Bible writers would say. Uh, and so the fact that we have oxygen to breathe is because of him. The fact that you and I were able to get up this morning and to come here to assemble is because of him. All things that we have in life that are good and wholesome and right are because of Jesus Christ. But then beyond that, why did we come here today? Because he is the Savior. So not only does he sustain our physical bodies, which is a wonderful thing in and of itself, but he is concerned about you and I, not just in this life, but especially unto eternal life. And therefore, Jesus came, he lived a life of example in this world, and then he died as the sacrifice for our sins. He became the Lamb of God for you and I. So he is our creator and our sustainer. He is our savior, but then also he is our eternal judge. 
Isn't it nice that we know the judge? And not only that, he is our judge, but over in, in 1 John chapter 2, we're told that he's also our advocate. The idea is that he is our lawyer. And, and so he is both judge and lawyer for you and I. He's on our side. He wants us to go to heaven. You know, some people have the idea of God uh, that, that you know, he's against us. You know, he's just looking to, to nitpick and find where he can cause us to, to fall. No, that's not the God we serve. The God we serve was willing to die for us so that we could go to heaven with him. And so you and I have plenty of reasons, and we, we could continue on talking about the reasons why we should be grateful and why we should, uh, should express our thanksgiving to the Lord Jesus. He has done so many wonderful things for us. These folks are gathered together because they have great gratitude for Jesus. In Mary's anointing of Jesus, we see that in her mind, she needed to give the very best for Jesus because he was the very best. Uh, Jesus deserves the best that we have to offer. When we have the opportunity to host a, a special guest in our home. I'm sure that you've had someone in your home at one point or another that was a, a, an honored guest. Uh, we tend to go above and beyond. You know, when's the last time that you had a special guest in your home and you dug into the back of the fridge to find where the leftovers were and that's what we were going to serve to our guest? Now, if that's all that we have, then that's what we'll do, right? But typically, we're going to, to be preparing a, a new meal, a good meal for them, and we're not going to be serving them the leftovers. That's what we'll eat later on when our guest is not there anymore. Now, I don't know that you and I are ever going to have the opportunity to, to host some great dignitary. Uh, my notes say the queen, which dates my notes, the, the king now would be the case. I don't think that King Charles is coming to my home or your home or that we're going to have any great dignitary, but if we were to do that, if we had that occasion, that opportunity, not only would we make sure that we've got a good meal to prepare for them, we're not bringing the leftovers out, we would be sure to groom ourselves in a, in a suitable fashion, we would prepare ourselves, prepare the home, prepare the meal, make everything just right. Because we have a, a, a great magnitude of honor and respect for the one who is coming into our home. And yet, let me suggest to you that any dignitary or any large name, including the king, if they were to come to our home, that pales in comparison to Jesus Christ. Martha and Mary and Lazarus I believe on several occasions, had the opportunity to host Jesus. One of those occasions is in Luke chapter 10. If you want to go ahead and turn over into Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we find Jesus coming into their home. And at verse 38, beginning, Luke 10 and at verse 38... It says, it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken from her. We see the hustle and bustle of Martha. I understand Martha. You know, she wants to make sure that everything is just right. At, well, Jesus is in our house. We need to make sure everything is just perfect for Jesus because he is here. And so she is working feverishly to make sure the meal is good and, and you know, the table set exactly as it ought to be. May I suggest to you that Jesus wasn't so concerned about the meal. And he wasn't all that concerned about whether she had good china uh, plates or you know, fine silver out or any of those kinds of things whatsoever. 
Uh, but we see in the urgency of Martha just this desire to make sure that she gives the best for Jesus because our Lord deserves the best. And so, again, coming back to Mary, and we'll have more to say on, on uh, Luke 10 in, in just a bit, perhaps, but coming back to, to Mary, she didn't just bring some common scented oil. You know, there's the, the average oils that you would buy down at the marketplace that are, you know, they're 50% off maybe at times or whatever it be, right? The, the, just the very generic ones. That is not what she brought. She brought a flask of costly oil. It's identified in the text as oil of spikenard. Now, this plant that the oil came from, uh, it's an imported oil. It's not something local. It comes from the Himalayas. It would have been very costly. And uh, in fact, when Judas tells us about it, he lets us know exactly how costly it is. But the oil of this plant, it's celebrated for the, the, the absolutely wonderful odor that it has. Uh, it's mentioned in Scripture just a few times here in our context with, with Mary, and then also a couple of times over in the Song of Solomon. Um, and so it, it's costly because of its, of its elegance, um, but then the amount. She didn't have a sample flask. That's not it. It's not that she brought out some tiny little flask and, okay, we're going to, oh, we ran out of oil, right? She has a pound of this costly oil of spikenard. And it is enough to accomplish this anointing and to fill the house with this wonderful fragrance. And so Judas, and I'm not sure that he's an oil appraiser, but he seems to know a little bit about what he's talking about. He says, we could have sold that. 300 denarii, that's the value of, of this oil, which he presumes was wasted. 300 denarii. Well, as we look in the scriptures, a, a denarius is considered to be a day's wage. 300 denarii is basically a year's salary. We're talking about a year's worth of money here for this one flask of oil. She brought a lot. She gave a lot. She gave the best for Jesus Christ. Very costly indeed. Now, Mark tells us that she poured the oil on his head. That would be a commonplace thing among the Jews, that you would uh, anoint one's head. It was a display of hospitality. Uh, there's also some health benefits uh, involved in it. In the hot atmospheres of the East, it served to refresh the, uh, the guest who has come in, to exhilarate them in, in some degree. Um, but the quality of oil that, that she used is far above what they would normally use for that purpose. But John adds something here. Not only did she anoint his head, which that would be the commonplace thing to do, she anointed his feet. There's something special going on here. John says she anointed his feet and then she wiped them with her hair. Pliny the Elder in his work Natural History speaks about the anointing of the feet and says that it is an extreme luxury. You just simply don't get your feet anointed with oil if you're a common individual. You'll have your feet washed with water but not anointed with oil, and certainly not oil of spikenard. This is the kind of thing that is reserved for the exceptionally wealthy or royalty. Well, Jesus was not exceptionally wealthy, but he is royalty. And I perceive that Mary understands that. In fact, there are places in Scripture that identify Jesus not just as a king, he is most certainly king, but he is the king of kings. There is no king greater than this king who is in their home. And so she anoints his feet. But further to that, John tells us that she wiped then his feet with her hair. That's also significant. My understanding is that that is something a servant would do for a master. And so in doing this, what she has just declared about Jesus is that he is both Lord and King. He is her master. He is her king. 
just amazing and wonderful that that she has done this. Now, let me say there was never too much that we could do or too much that we could give for Jesus. But when we start placing limitations on, well, I'll go this far but no further, that's a problem. How much did he give? He gave his life. He died for you and I. And the expectation is that we will therefore give our lives to him. Now, not, we're not going to bring 300 denarii worth of costly oil of spikenard and anoint Jesus' feet. You and I are not in her position. We are not able to do that. But we are called upon to give ourselves entirely, not just the leftovers. Sometimes what folks end up doing is they give Jesus the leftovers of their life. You know, they've got all these things that are keeping them busy and that they need to pay attention to, and so they, they do all of that, and then, well, here, Lord, I'll give you what's left over. We've got it backwards if that's the way we're doing it. Jesus gets the first fruit. He gets the first and foremost of our life. And I understand that we're busy and we've got things that we need to do, but as we said yesterday, I believe it was, we need to be sure that we are a child of God in all those things that we do and make those a part of our service to Him as well. We are called upon to give ourselves entirely. Romans 12 verse 1, uh, we've referenced it earlier in the series, but we're going to look at verse 1 and 2. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You and I are called upon to be those living sacrifices, and, and in the process of that, Paul says, that means we're going to be different. Do not be conformed to this world. If we look like the world, how are we going to shine as lights in the world of darkness if we look like the world of darkness? And so we are called to be different. Do not be transformed to this world, but uh, are conformed to this world, excuse me, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. The more that you and I will spend our time in this book, and then get this book in our mind and live our life by it, we will see that we have been transformed by the will of God to display the character of Christ. In Romans chapter 6 and at verse 13, and again at verse 16, Paul writes, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? The fact is, there's no middle ground in this. Either we are a servant of the Lord and therefore we are committed to righteousness, or we are a slave of sin. That's the opposite, and we're going to do whatever we want to do in that case. But there, there's no middle ground. It's one or the other. Because as soon as we step away from being a servant of the Lord and walking in righteousness, well, what are we doing? We're walking in unrighteousness, and we're not serving the Lord. And so you know, we can cozy up a little bit, and then, well, I'll give part of my life to Jesus. Well, where's the rest of our life then? there's no dividing up our life. It's either entirely His, and we've made ourselves slaves of righteousness to serve Him and to glorify Him, or we are walking with the rest of the world. We need to make the right choice. We need to be like Mary and present ourselves as servants to the Lord and be willing to give Him our best and do so every day. That is what we've been called to do. Now, the phrase... No good deed goes unpunished. Anyone familiar with that phrase? Uh, it's actually an old phrase. It dates back to the 12th century. Um, Walter Mapp, uh, from what I could see, is the first one who had uh, used it in a document titled The Nigus Carillium. I may have said that wrong, but say it fast, say it confident, move on. Um, and it's appeared with some frequency after that time. This idea of no good deed goes unpunished. Well, the, the statement, of course, is an exaggeration. Obviously, there are some good deeds that end up not being punished for, 
for doing so. But unfortunately, there are people who will murmur and complain and find fault and belittle those who are doing good. It seems like they've got nothing better to do, and so that is what they find themselves doing. Well, that's the case with Mary. Mary has done a wonderful deed by anointing Jesus, his head and his feet, uh, with this costly oil of spikenard. This is a wonderful thing. And yet a troublemaker comes along, and that troublemaker is Judas Iscariot. And so he, he feigns concern for the poor. You know, this is 300 denarii. Do you know what we could do with 300 denarii with a, a year's wages? If, if we were to sell that and go minister to the poor, there is so much we could do. Well, you know what? He's right. If, if you've got 300 denarii back in the first century and you have devoted that to ministering to the poor, you could do a lot for the poor with a year's worth of, of wages. And so he speaks out against her. She's done something good, but he speaks out against her. John quickly points out, hold on, folks, he's not interested in the poor. That's not why he brings this up. He is a thief. He's the one who has the money box, and he used to take what was put into it. So he was looking for his cut of the 300 denarii that he would then line his pocket with. But as is often the case, one complainer will beget another complainer, right? And that's what happened here. Judas was the beginning of it. He's the one who started complaining, hey, th this is a waste. We could have sold this. What are you doing? Why would you do this? And then it continued to the point where Matthew 26, verse 8 says that the rest of them, and so the rest of the apostles, became indignant as well. And they were asking, why this waste? They are reiterating Judas's concern and, and his complaint and making it their own. What short-sighted individuals. And, and at that point, unspiritual in, in their understanding. This was no waste. May I suggest to you that Mary was more in tune with what was going on than the disciples were. Now, I don't know, I don't know how much Mary does understand. But I do know that at this point, she is at least more in tune than the apostles are. Jesus has been telling the apostles for some time now about his impending death, burial, and resurrection. He's not been holding it secret from them. He's been revealing it to them. In Mark chapter 8 and at verse 31, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. In response, that's the occasion when Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Not so, Lord. But does, does Peter know better than Jesus? He seemed to think he did. So Mark 8, verse 31, Jesus told them about it. They didn't get it, didn't understand. Mark 9, verse 31 Jesus taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. So that's twice at least. There may be occasions that are not recorded, but twice at least that he has told them, This is what's going to happen, uh, fellas. And verse 32 tells us they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. I don't know what he's talking about. That doesn't fit our concept of Messiah. It doesn't make any sense, but I don't want to talk to him about it. I'm afraid to. So two times. Mark 10. Mark 10, verse 32. He took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. And so in the verses that follow, uh, and, and, and he talks to them about the death, burial, and resurrection. The verses that follow, there is no response from the apostles. It, I think it's very much like what we had in chapter 9 and verse 32. We don't understand what he's talking about, but we're afraid to ask him about it. There, there's just no response. Well, except for one thing. James and John go to him and ask him, Hey, could we have seats of prominence when you come in your kingdom? Could we be on your right hand and your left hand when you start your kingdom up? They don't understand what's about to happen. They don't get it. They're in denial about it. And so... How much does Mary understand? Again, I don't know. But I am confident she grasped more than they did. 
and therefore she takes this occasion to anoint him. Now, Jesus defends her. Mark chapter 14 and verse 6. Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. In their ignorance, they perceived it was wasteful and spoke against her. Mary was not detoured. She did not stop. Just because they're speaking out against it doesn't mean she's going to stop what she's doing. And Jesus encouraged her by defending her. Now, as you and I seek to do good in our service to God, understand that there are going to be people who will criticize us. And sometimes some of those people may even be our own brethren who will criticize us, which is unfortunate. But those who are without knowledge or who have limited knowledge are often very quick to criticize and condemn others who are acting. And they may not understand why, but, but they just they, they go end up criticizing in the midst of that. And, and not only that, but at times, those who are doing absolutely nothing, who are inactive, will feel justified in speaking out against those who are doing something, which is unfortunate. I don't know if it makes them feel better, it makes them feel bad that we're doing something, or, or what the case is, but, but that's often what happens. And if we are doing God's will, do not let the naysayers stop you. If we are doing something that is not God's will, then by all means, we need to stop. But if we are doing what's God, what is God's will, do not be discouraged. Mary had the, all of the disciples. You talk about some people that you don't want speaking out against you, right? These are the 12 apostles. And they spoke out against her. She would not be stopped by them because she was doing a good work. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and at verse 15, we're told, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to know why we're doing what we're doing. And if we know why we're doing what we're doing in the service of the Lord, then we maybe can explain to them why we're doing what we're doing and encourage them to join in with us as well. Uh, and so we should be able to defend ourselves by Scripture. And if we see others being attacked by people for what they're doing and they're doing something that is right, we ought to go and stand in their defense as well. Keep in mind, even if everybody's against you, you know, if you're doing what is right and everybody is opposed to what you're doing, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul wrote this, If God is for us, who can be against us? If God's on my side, then I'm on the right place. Regardless of how many are opposed to what I'm doing, I am in the right place, and I need to continue doing His will. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it tells us that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We've been saved to do good, and so we need to be about good. And, and so, you know, don't sit back and, and, and do nothing. Go ahead and do good, even if that means people are going to belittle us. Uh, we need to persevere in that. Be unmoved by the criticism that comes our way. Mark chapter 14 and at verse 8. Jesus said of Mary, she has done what she could. She has done what she could. Paul expresses the same kind of sentiment to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians in chapter 8 regarding the giving and, and, and supplying for the needs of others, ministering to the needy saints specifically in the context in Judea. At verse 12 of chapter 8, he says this, If there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. That's, that's an exceptional text. You, know, you don't have to do everything. You know, we don't have to amass the entirety before we can do something in the service of God. According to the ability that we have, according to what we do have, it is acceptable. Now, if we don't do something with what we do have, then it is unacceptable. Remember, the same kind of concept appears over in the parable of the talents. The master gives to each of the servants according to his ability. The master knows his servants. And so to one he gives five talents, to the other he gives two talents, and to another he gives one talent. It's not that uh, the one talent man, he didn't expect anything of him. He did. He just, he knew if I give him five talents, he'll be overwhelmed. He won't know what to do with that. And so he gave him one. 
And so the five talent man goes out and he does work and for, for the master and he brings back five more talents. And the two talent man, likewise, he goes and he works for the master and he brings back two more talents. And the one talent man did absolutely nothing. Well, he did go dig a hole and bury the talent. And when the master came back, remember what the master said. He called him a wicked and lazy servant. Just because I don't have five talents doesn't mean that I cannot do for God what needs to be done with what I do have. I am responsible to use what I have. It is accepted according to what he has and not according to what he does not have. Be sure to have the willing mind, though. If we don't have the willing mind, we're going to go and dig a hole and bury it and just be satisfied. Okay, well, I, I didn't lose whatever it was. We need to go and do the work for the Lord. The Lord expects us to do what we can with what we have, nothing more, nothing less. Well, what did Mary do? Jesus said she has done a good work for him. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Was that Mary's specific intent when she brought the oil of spikenard? I don't know. Again, I'm not sure how much she understood, but what Jesus does is he applies what she did to that. Again, this is another opportunity for the disciples to understand he's going to be taken and put to death and he'll rise again. But they still, I don't think, get it. She has done what she could, and she has anointed his body. Remember, on the first day of the week, they would come to the tomb with uh, the, the uh, spices to anoint his body, and there was no body to anoint. And so he applies this to what they would be unable to do later on. And so we need to do what we can in our service to God and be imitators of Mary in that. And let's close out our time by talking about priorities. You know, the, the argument put forth by Judas was that, hey, we, we ought to serve the poor. You know, Mary is wasting this. We could use this to go and serve the poor. Jesus' response was this. You have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me, you do not always have. What an exceptional statement. The poor are always going to be there. And, and tomorrow, you can go serve the poor. But today, Jesus is there, and this opportunity is not going to be available again. And so, Mary has done what is right. It's not that Jesus is not concerned about poor people. He is. It's not that Jesus doesn't want his people ministering to poor people. He does. But it is a matter of priority. And so that's what we see with Mary, is that she is setting priority here. And so you, you can do to go, uh, good to the poor at any time. There is a limited opportunity for this to take place. Mary takes advantage of that limited opportunity because Jesus is soon going to be arrested and then put to death, and, and Mary wouldn't have had the opportunity to do what she did. And again, when they went to the tomb, the body wasn't there. And so we need to be sure to take advantage of the opportunities that we have in order to serve the Lord. I understand we've got family responsibilities, we've got work responsibilities, we've got community responsibilities, and all of those are important. But if you are a child of God, your first responsibility is to Jesus Christ. And we need to be sure that we put him first and foremost in our lives. Because um, that's what we've been called to do. We've been called to put Jesus first. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, no.